episode of the Better Two Podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of My Days with the Dark Muse, as well as Love is Worth Waiting For. Hi, gang. Donna here. Thanks for tuning in to the Better Two Podcast. Today's guest is Amanda Keith. Amanda did something that most people were walking away from, including myself. During the pandemic, she decided to do something that, well, most of us ran from. We decided we couldn't do this anymore and we're closing up shop. But Amanda decided, you know what? Her and her husband, TJ, decided let's go and open a brick and mortar. But there's more to her journey than that. We talk about New Orleans. We talk about history. We talk about religion and we talk about life. So stay tuned. Hi, Amanda. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Delana? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We we did this once before and we had some quality issues. So we're doing <laughs> this again and okay. it's much delayed, but that's okay. So you own a store, an internet store originally called Three Crows Conjure. Yes. Tell me a little bit about your store before we go into the better two thing you did. <laughs> well, the online store came about, I was literally, I got started in Birmingham, Alabama. I was working for a shop down there called Books, Beans, and Candles, and I fell in love. Like, literally, I started working there, and it was like, man, you know, I really love being a part of that community. And, well, when I came home, about four years later, I had to come back to Indiana, and literally, <laughs> I had set that goal. But then when I came back and I helped my grandparents pass, coming back to Indiana, um, and that I knew that was my goal, that that's why I was going back. I was like, you know what? I was working for shops. I'd worked a couple of shops here and I was like, I'm done. I had just had my, my first son and I was like, I'm done working for others. It's just, it wasn't me. I wasn't fulfilled and I didn't know. At first, I thought brick and mortar. I had to have that. And TJ's like, let's do online. There's online stores now. And I was like, what? I don't know how to work online. I don't know how to do a website. Like, it was so scary. And But I took the leap. And we yeah. took the leap together. So, you know, that journey. And it was kind of like three crows was the inspiration. Um, I love crows. Crows are one of my... I guess if you want to say spirit animals or totems, I love working with crows. And even as a little girl, they're everywhere. I mean, Indiana, especially me growing up in a suburb outside of Indianapolis, we had cornfields everywhere. So, <laughs> yes. And then uh, there was the Indiana Beach commercial with the mm -hmm. crow that there's more than corn in Indiana, there's Indiana Beach. Yes. I, I lived in Indiana for a bit. So I, I'm That's well right. familiar with that. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I was like, you know, Maybe my goal, the whole purpose is to be of service and to educate. And I've been really quiet since, you know, the latter part, everything that's been opening up since the pandemic. But uh, we'll talk about that later. I've been on the back burner, but it's like, that's my passion is like, I love to help heal and I love to help people get into their abilities and to help them grow and um, flourish get back on their path. Well, and that, that's the thing. I mean, when you are, when you're working for somebody else, especially in this, this business, your vision is not necessarily going to align with their vision. There used to be a shop that I went to that my teacher taught at um, mm -hmm. when I was learning how to read cards and she used to teach an intuition class. And the lady that went there, you know, you think metaphysical store, you're going to think it's all going to be love and light, da, da, da. This woman was very, very cold. I mean, there wasn't a very warm, there was not warmth to her at all. It was very, I don't want to say clinical because clinical is not the word. And I don't want to say the B word because I'm yeah. not going to curse today. Yeah. But um, it was just, there was just this coldness to it. It's like, you're asking a question and she's just matter of fact in your face. And it wasn't heartwarming. It was just kind of like, okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I get it. I get why if you're not comfortable working and, it, and it's not your vision because each shop li lends itself to the creator's vision. So if someone is more into Christianity or somebody is more into paganism, it's going to skew either way. Even though they may have the other things, it's going to skew the way the owner feels. 
Yes. Yeah. And I'm uh, sure, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I think that's what was the issue. Like I went from one extreme, which was a pagan based shop. Okay. And it was very, not, I'm not talking in Birmingham, but I mean here, like I, I went and it was kind of like a little kitschy, you know, kind of like just a simple, they had indigo candles, all the typical, like, and then I went to a new age shop, like a metaphysical, and it was a completely different, like, do not say pagan, do not do this. And I'm like, I asked to carry Florida water and they were like, oh no, we can't do that. Why? You, you asked me for suggestions for my clientele. Why can't you do this? And it was kind of like, yeah, no, I'm done. <laughs> Wow. I guess I hate to say it, it was one of those um, metaphysical stores that was very much like Walmart. Like even my dad, who's very fundamental Christian, but he knows me. He goes, Mandy, why are you working there? And I was like, because. <laughs> it, it would be like you said, Walmart. I mean, it was it, it's kind of like I was working at an event um, and this lady and her, her grandson walked up and had some mm -hmm. crystals on the table, had a nice piece of amethyst. And the boy was fascinated by it. And the grandma goes, oh, those are God's crystals. <laughs> and I just, I, I was just like, I had never heard it phrased that way, but I was just like, uh -huh. okay, if that's what makes you feel connected, then yes. run with it. But it's like, I don't know why we have to label everything to make it homogenized. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. It's there. That's, I mean, it, the creator made it. So mm -hmm. there you go. And whatever you name that creator is your choice. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing when we, and I mean, I don't really have a lot of religious conversations. I do have a couple, um, but it's like really religion. If you really break it down, mm -hmm. it's all the same message. If you really break it down and a lot of organized religion, and I can get in trouble for this is about control yeah, and yeah. guilt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but if that's what if that's what resonates with you and makes you feel okay, then that's your thing. And I'm not going to say anything wrong with it, but allow everybody to practice what they want. As long as it's not doing harm to anybody else. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, to me, it's like I'm very eclectic as it is. I've been on this path since I was... <sighs> My first book was at 13 and I really started taking classes at 18. Like as soon as I could, it was just like, boom, boom, boom. Because I remember being in a house and they were like, you're not having an altar. And I'm like, I want an altar. And they're like, you're not having an altar. And I'm like, and I've had my little altar. Like I had like a manifestation box that I made for wishing. And I did like what I could, but every time I'd like that candle, <laughs> like my mom would come in, you're not a burn out. I'm like, yeah, whatever. No, you know? So go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say that was, you know, kind of my beginnings. But um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, growing up in New Orleans, um, my mom would take me to like Bottom of the Teacup and other places to get yes. her cards read. And I'd mm -hmm. sit there and I'd look around and I'd be curious as anything. But of course, if I mentioned that I wanted to dabble in this, even mm -hmm. though I was intuitive as anything, nope. Mm -mm. But I would have, I would have, I would have prognosticating dreams and stuff and no things and nope, mm -hmm. can't do it. So I remember once I finally started embracing stuff and I, that was a journey in the nineties. But when I finally, one of my friends came over who was Wiccan and mm -hmm. none of my friends had ever commented. She came in my bedroom and cause I was like, well, we were, cause we were talking about Wicca and stuff. And I'm like, well, I, I do burn candles. And she comes in and, and she sees this, I have this table and I have candles and I have, you know, some presentation and she goes, and you say you're not a witch. And I'm like, excuse me? She goes, you <laughs> say you're not a witch. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just burned candles. She goes, this is an altar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're a natural witch. Get over it. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So, I mean, it's not that I've embraced my witchiness. It's just one of those things where it's like, I do what I am comfortable with and what calls to me and you know my belief system is kind of a hodgepodge of what i believe yeah yeah but yeah I just I, go ahead no i was gonna say and that's the beauty of it that that right there and that's how it was with me i was very natural in what i was doing you know i 
I would go and sit in the trees like my grandparents when I was growing up living with them. I would literally <laughs> go sit in their birch tree and I didn't understand why. You know, it just felt comfortable and I would sit and talk to the birds and animals would gravitate and then I'd want to go rescue them, you know, mm -hmm. as a kid. And it was just simple things or flowers helping my grandmother garden and helping, you know, just those steps. And then I remember when I was three years old and only a child could do this, okay? God was always mentioned in the house, you know, it was always kind of talked about. But I watched this commercial of, it was, I can't believe it's not butter commercial. Literally with mother earth. Okay. I saw her and I don't know what it was. I saw all the animals, all just the nature. And I was like, that makes sense. There's a goddess and there's a God, there's a mother earth and there's a God. And I remember later on about a couple months later, my dad was like, well, you believe in God. And I go, yes, mother earth too. <laughs> and he was like, no, Mandy. And I was like, yes, dad, why not? And I was like, you know, the strong three-year-old. And I was always the kind of person that would always question mm -hmm. why or what, why do I have to do this? You know? So, well, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Why do we, we were like today is earth day. When we're recording mm -hmm. this, it's actually earth day, but nobody really recognizes that unless you know it became it was not something that was really talked about and then it regained surgeons in what the 90s it became yeah. a big thing again and it's like but we still don't embrace the power of the goddess and yeah. one thing that really ticked me off and okay I, i'm a child of the 70s i used to love the shazam isis hour okay <laughs> that was like my go-to show and it really ticked me off when they they didn't they decided to call themselves or they were labeled Isis. Cause it's like, you are demeaning the goddess. Yeah. And that's yeah. not who they are. And they're not claiming that you've labeled that to tarnish. The, the goddess. goddess. Yeah. I felt the same way because I worked with the goddess Isis myself. She was the very first goddess that ever came to me. And I grew up loving Egyptology and studying Egypt. And then when I was in meditation, it was her. So at the beginning of my path, and then when all of that transpired, like you said, I was like, and I even put something on my Facebook one time of ISIS and explaining of who ISIS was and that she wasn't part and did not believe in part of the terrorism. And I had one, a family member, basically, he's very Republican and very, you know, mm -hmm. and he was like, you're wrong. I'm sorry. You believe in this, you know? It, it, it was, it was, it literally, I never talked to him again. I unfriended him. I unliked him, just tossed it to the side because I was like, you don't know. And you're being very arrogant and ir just ignorant at this point, mm -hmm. you know? So, well, yeah. What I find funny is, you know, think, thinking back to me being a little kid, I guess I was about maybe between seven and eight years old, seven, you know, and I'm running around going, oh, mighty ISIS. <laughs> because that's what she would say to transform. And it's like, well, I guess at that point, really technically, was I calling the goddess without even realizing it? You were. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't <laughs> think about those things. So when you think about it, so every little kid that was watching it that decided to start doing that, we were all yeah. it didn't we last. We were all kind of evoking, whether we knew we were invoking or not, yeah. you know, it was kind of like, yep, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, and that's the funny thing about like the metaphysical industry, because you have to say it's an industry. You can't just say it, yeah. it's because, you know, it used to be you had maybe 30 decks to choose from. And now you have everybody's got a deck. Yeah. I had a friend tell me the other day, why don't you create a tarot deck? I'm like, really? Right. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I, and the thing is, you know, for me, tarot, I, I, I I'm a reader. Mm -hmm. And I have about 30 decks, including the Salvador Dali deck, which is pretty darn awesome. That's awesome. But I don't read with it. And I don't read with every deck I own. But mm -hmm. when somebody sits there and says, well, the, the Ten of Cups is happy family. And the Cosmic Tarot, she looks depressed. She's looking away from a, a stack of cups. And she looks depressed because she's not looking behind her to her future. Yes. But yet, you know, the, the traditional meaning, and it's like, no, you can't always look, when you look at all the creation of decks now, the traditions, traditional meanings have gone out the window in some cases. 
Well, and when, like when I teach tarot, I teach from a perspective because it was taught to me to be intuitive, you know, to take whatever deck that you have and to go, what stands out to you? Take, mm -hmm. take a minute each day and take a card and what stands out and write it down. Like, this is the thing I'm noticing with a lot of people these days, they don't want to do the work. Like they don't want to write it down. They don't want to meditate. They don't want to do what needs to be done. And it's like, you have to, or you're not going to you're not going to get the full effect. You got to have the discipline with the practice, but I love teaching tarot that way. And it opens up because a lot of people I've noticed also, because they go from what's in the book and it's like, throw the book out, mm -hmm. look at it mm -hmm. and then see how they connect, see how they unfold. Exactly. And I mean, for me, when I, when I started reading, yes, I actually, I had come across my mom had a tarot deck. This was after she had passed and it was the Rider weight and I could not connect with it to save my life. But one of my friends had this book called, I think it was called Tarot Made Easy. And mm -hmm. it's a really fun book because it's got all these categories. And so we would, I would start doing readings and I'm flipping through the pages and I was spot on with the reading, but I mean, I'm flipping through the pages because yeah. it gives like one sentence for each whatever topic. Yes. So finally I started taking an intuition class because my intuition just kept pinging and it's like, all right, fine. So I take the intuition class and I, it was a running joke with my teacher because everybody else kind of what you were saying about not everybody wanting to do the work. It's yeah. like, I'm six, seven months in and I'm the only constant student. And she's like, okay, class, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves. <laughs> and then she went right before she, I would get a, go to me. She's like, and here's the student that's always here. So she <laughs> decides, she's like, I'm going to teach a second intuition class. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, fine, I'll sign up. I was the only one in the class. She only did it for three times. And the last time I brought the Cosmic Tarot, because that's what she read with. And I really liked it because it had all the Hollywood stuff. Yep. And she's like, okay, she did exactly what you said. She's like, see this book? You don't need it? Put it away. <laughs> I'm like, all right. And so she sat there and she showed me a little bit. And then she's like, I want you to read for me. I'm like, what? And so she made me that night. And I realized after doing this for 20 plus years that what you see in those cards changes too. There mm -hmm. was the two of cups in that deck. There is no dog in that deck or in that card. There's none. Mm -hmm. Yet there was one lady I was reading and I'm like, I saw a dog and I'm like, you love this dog. You love your dog more than anybody else. And she's like, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Just like, okay. So that's the thing. It's <laughs> like, John, my husband was always saying this, it's printed paper. It's the reader who has the power and the interpretation. And I remember being at Barnes and this girl was looking at cards and, you know, being a reader, you want to give advice sometimes. And I'm like, you know, I said, are you looking for a deck? She goes, yeah. She's like, I, I had a reading Saturday. She said I was intuitive. So I'm going to get a deck and go into business. Oh, yeah. And I just looked at her. I was like, really? I said, well, make sure you call, choose a deck that calls to you. Oh, well, I'm going to get a right away. Cause that's what she had. Like, okay, bye. <laughs> No. It doesn't, it doesn't work that quickly, <laughs> but that's what exactly to your point of, oh, well, I got a deck of cards. I can do this. No worries. It, it, it's been frustrating because I've had clients that way where they'll just, they have intuition, just a basic intuition and they've got it and they're, and I'm just like, hold, hold on. And they're like, nope, I'm gone. And they'll go. And it's like, and they're like, I'm on TikTok. I can do it. And I was like, I hope you're really studying and really mastering because you need it <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's so important to have the grounding and the ground, the foundation, you know, when I started doing tarot, I really probably had no business doing it, but it was spirit led. I have been doing this since I, I've seen spirits. I'm a medium. I do this since I was a little girl. And I would see the spirits just like I would see me and you. Like it was always that very clear, distinct. And I was always very intuitive. And then as I grew, it it expanded. And as I learned, and then I went into the temple of witchcraft with Christopher Pinsack. And I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, well, I naturally did this. And oh, I naturally did this. And it's kind of like, okay. So I'm on point. Luckily, I've had spirits to save my ass over some foolishness that I could have done. And that's the truth. <laughs> I believe you. 
I'm like, I've always been drawn to spirit boards, but I've always known to cast a circle, cleanse the space, even if it's just with incense, cleanse the, it's moving and setting that space. And it's just like, yeah. And I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. It's definitely dedication. It's definitely a passion. Um, and it, it, yeah, well, discipline. It, it, for me, the medium thing was not something that I had planned on. It just, I was working a party and somebody's dad came through and I'm like, your dad really wants to talk to you. You can do this. No, I can't. Yeah, you can. You can talk to your dad. No, no, I can't. Finally, when I was done reading her, I'm just like, give me your hands. I didn't know what I was doing. And sure enough, I connect with them. And it was just like, oh. okay, here we go. And that's when I realized, and, and it, it's happened other times. And it's like, okay, so the reluctant medium, that's how I like to describe myself because it wasn't something that I wanted. It was just something that came about. And for me, I don't see them. They, they come to me, I feel them. I feel how mm -hmm. they died. And then they give me cues and words and feelings and emotions. So I, I would rather see them, I think, although I guess it would be kind of grisly at times, but yeah, I, I, feeling it's not always great. Yeah, I think being a medium in general is hard because I know when I was little, I wouldn't sleep. Like my dad would call me the midnight creeper because I'd get up in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep. And I'd, I'd see things and I didn't understand what I was seeing as a child. And then as I've gotten older, I've, you know how when you're driving, you can literally kind of get in a meditative state. Mm -hmm. And literally I'm sitting there driving and I'm slamming on my brakes, luckily late at night. I'm not thinking anything. I'm thinking a man is walking across the road and there's a, it's a ghost. It's a spirit. And I'm just like, can you just stay? And I'm passing the graveyard as I'm doing this. I'm like, can you just stay in the graveyard? Just, just, if you see a car, just, yeah. you know, and it's kind of like, well, and there's two, two schools of thought. I was going to say something about my friend, Sarah Martucci, who's been on the show when she was talking mm -hmm. about when she was a little kid, you know, she was seeing like this man who had water coming out of his mouth at the foot of her bed. And it turned out that there was a shipwreck not too far from their house, like 1800s. And, you know, my husband, once again, the reluctant dude, he saw people, he saw my mom, but yet, no, I can't, I can't see this. And then there's the other caveat to, if you have a good parent, your parent did well. Yeah. Compared to, I had another friend who was a medium that their her parents took her to be exercised, and we're not yep. talking to the gym. So yep. I, I mean, it's one of those things. And and the thing about it is, as kids, we are more open to being in touch with our intuition and seeing spirits and everything. And as we get, you know, we go to school or we have parents that don't believe in it, they're like, "You're crazy. Just shut you down. You cannot do mm -hmm. these things." Yeah. That's what I had. I literally, even though, and that's the funny thing, my dad was actually as a teenager because he's half indigenous and he's half Scottish. Okay. My grandmother was Apache and Cherokee, the two tribes. Nice. Okay. So he, we had the gifts, but we never talked about it. And then as my dad, he went on his search to find the indigenous. And then he was also, you know, experimental. And, you know, <laughs> and uh, he had a bad experience. He picked up on something mm, okay. and he shut down after that and would not like, even to this day, he won't tell me what, what he saw. He just tells me what happened. And I was like, okay. So he always kind of worries with me, but now he's like, I know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, even though I don't necessarily agree. Like he's gone to the shop. He's seen the shop, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, I guess we'll talk about that later, but you know, it's just kind of like, it's evolving and like, I've kind of helped him and we'll talk about herbalism and, and stuff like that, but whatever he's comfortable with and then we'll come back around, you know, Yeah. but the mediumship, I will say has been a gift to help people in their transitions and, and being a death doula. And that's a new part of my journey that I'm just now really kind of embracing and starting um, since my grandparents and I've done that and I've helped and done some funerals and, you know, it's been, it's turned what I thought was a curse is, is a blessing in disguise.
So well, tell me about being a death doula. I mean, what does that, because that's not a very common term. I mean, we hear, <sighs> you know. Well, I mean, for me, but. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what it is. You're helping that person during their transitions, you know, going, do you have any, um, you know, anything that you want? You know, what are their wishes? You know, is there things that you want to be left behind? You know, memories, thoughts, you know, is there, you know, is there any questions in theirs? You know, a lot of it is just making them come to a term to their new birth. And that's kind of how you, how death is. It's the opposite of birth. So each is a transition into a new world, a new beginning. And it's a transition. <laughs> so yeah. during being a death doula, it can be, it can be difficult. It can be long. Um, you know, when I was helping my grandmother, I would literally come over once a day and I would um, massage her for an hour and I'd do Reiki on her because she was in so much pain, but yet nobody would, <sighs> she wasn't getting the answers. And then I kept picking up on cancer and I was so afraid to tell her. Like, I was just like, I, I didn't want to tell her in case I was wrong. And literally finally about two weeks before she did die, they diagnosed her with stage four lung cancer. Okay. And the only thing I found out afterwards, I didn't know how much I was helping her, but she had told my aunt that literally the only thing that helped her get through the pain, get through everything she was dealing with was that one hour massage. Because after I was done doing Reiki, after I was done doing what I was needing to do, and I'd sit and talk to her. We'd talk about memories. And then during the process, it's asking the family, do you have anything? Helping them to understand. And then um, helping the person in that transition, whether it's doing a ritual or setting space or just telling them it's okay. You know, because a lot of the times they'll fight yeah. because of the family or hold on because of their loved ones. You know, the most recent one, I guess I, I kind of did, and it was another personal one, was my father, um, my biological father. Um, I had a dream that he had died, and literally, me and my sister, I called um, <laughs> the, his phone, but the lady at the front desk was like, he's already dead. You You need to come and get his stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, no, why? Nobody called me? And he didn't have anything set up. So in the dream, me and my sister went and we picked up the stuff. I called my dad the next day. I mean, it was so just adamant. I go, dad, I know you right now are in good health or at least appearing to be in good health. I go, but we're going to do a death plan. We're going to get in. What are your final wishes? And we're going to write everything down. And it was the hardest conversation I had to have with my dad. And me and my biological father, we've never really been on the same level. We've never seen things eye to eye. But with that, I was able to sit down and really kind of give him peace. And I knew exactly where everything was, who to call, where was, you know, and these are so many things that people don't know and they don't want to talk about because they look at death and society looks at death as such a, um, a shame or it's <sighs> panic <laughs> is a way. And it's like, no, we need to see this as a natural way of life and a natural way of, um, it's a transition to show that we don't end, but there's not as much chaos in the end. Does that make sense if it's well, well prepared? And I think really that's what a death doula, and I think each death doula is different, but that tends to be kind of, what I've been drawn to. Makes sense. It makes, everything. it makes total sense. And and I mean, there are a lot of people that don't understand those things. That's why I wanted you to explain it. You yeah. know, we do look at death and, you know, you know that I went through that. It's yeah. coming up on two years. And I know that he's still around me because the day I actually closed my physical store, because in the beginning of June, we knew that we had to be out of the store by July. We knew we were mm -hmm. closing the store and he ended up passing before we got there. So I had to close the store by myself. And I remember when I was closing up his sewing room, 
it was the last thing I was doing and everything was out of there. And I was just standing by the door and I swear I felt him rub my back. Like it's okay. But it was just, it's one of those things where it's like that whole journey. And I can't say that I'm completely over. That's the one thing, you know, with grief, you don't, it, it's always going to be there. It's, there's always yes. going to be something to remind you, but it's a matter of healing and, and continuing on that. Yeah. Yes. You had a life before and you still have a life now. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those, it's just one of those things. And not, no matter what you do, it doesn't prepare you. I don't care if you knew you, this person ha- is on borrowed time. I don't care if it mm-hmm. happens suddenly. Nothing's going to prepare you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and that's the beauty of like doing, um, you know, as I've grown in my practice, you know, it's kind of taken me to the African, you know, diaspora traditions and, you know, that whole journey, um, which it, <laughs> It's it's honoring a, a part of my ancestry that had been forgotten and suppressed because I found out I do have African-American ancestry as well. And it's kind of like even with my indigenous, it's, it's still like we claimed white because it was the easiest way to do. And I lost a lot of culture and I lost a lot of just all of it in the process. And um, but it's helped me to honor my ancestors the best way I could. And I will tell you, working with the dead, working with um, the ancestors, <laughs> you will find things about yourself you didn't even know. Like and I had confirmation because, you know, I asked my dad, did you know, I had never seen my great grandfather before because he died when my grandmother was nine years old because he was significantly older than my grandmother, you know my great grandmother. And um, literally I was like, dad, does he, was he skinny? Was he kind of bald? And he was like, how the hell do you know this? And I was like, he goes, you saw him, didn't you? And I go, yeah, in a dream. And I go, what about my great, like, it was my grandmother's, my great grandmother's mother. So I guess, yeah, we'll go through there. But I literally, I remember having a dream and my ancestors, my great grandmother and my grandmother were showing me her picture. And I was like, did she look like this? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, so they'll show yourself. Like if you really want to know and you need that confirmation, but you've got to be willing to trust yourself. And I think that's what the key is to the discipline and the practice. Because if you don't, you're going to question what you're getting and you're going to end up blocking my, my husband used to always say, how do you know? And it's like, you just do. And when I think back, you know, talking about dreams and stuff, mm-hmm. after my mom died, I would have these dreams where she would come and tell me she wasn't dead. Cause I never saw, she, she committed suicide and then she was cremated before I ever saw her. So I never had that closure and she would constantly tell me she was still alive. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, no, no, no. And about a month before I was going to marry my first husband, she comes to me and she's got my youngest stepdaughter with her. So I'm I'm thinking now when I look back, I'm like, she wanted me to pay attention. Mm-hmm. But and so she's <laughs> like, she's like, I have to tell you something. And I'm like, no, you don't. You're dead. She's like, and this, of course, I'm not evolved spiritually yet. So <laughs> and I'm like, she's like, no, I have to tell you something seriously. I'm like, no, you're dead. Go away. No, mm-hmm. seriously. I'm like, go away. So she did. We got married in February. Our marriage was on the rocks. Um, By the time October rolled around and we completely ended the marriage, well, not formally, but I left in January. Wow. At the same time of that dream. So it's like, I look back at that dream and go, she was trying to warn me. Yeah. In the, in the universe, I mean, there was more things. The cake collapsed. The minister did. I mean, there was so many things. The universe was like screaming to go, don't do this. And I was like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> don't you love it when they step in? It's like, you know, like we, whether it's like trying to get something or trying to get somewhere, they'll block you. They're yeah. like, I remember one time I, I was trying to go to a concert for whatever reason. I was going down to Louisville. No big deal. We get to Louisville, they block off the exits. I cannot get into the city. And I was like, well, chalk it up. I lost the money. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's done. And I was like, for whatever reason, I wasn't supposed to go, even though I, I had the ticket, everything was good. So 
spirit will do that. Like if it's not meant to be, it will. But it's also amazing to see the opposite. I was going to say, say, I was, was going to say, say, I've had those <laughs> moments, moments like Live Aid. I wasn't supposed to go to Live Aid, but I said when they announced Live Aid, I'm like, I would give anything to go to Live Aid, which I know is not really something you should say. But at 17 mm. years old, you say stupid stuff like this. Yeah. And fast forward, like, because this is Shreveport, that's not a big hub at the time. No. This was, I think, December, January when they announced it. I don't even remember. But fast forward to two weeks before, or the week before 4th of July weekend. So the end of June, they announced they're going to have a contest. July 4th weekend, you got to stay up and count how many times they play studio on the radio. Yeah. So me and my friend did it. She was color number one. I was color number six. So I didn't get any place, but you had to be color one or color number nine. <laughs> And she was caller number one. And here's the thing. I was 17. She was younger than me. And I was her legal guardian. <laughs> you gotta love the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The radio station signed off on it. It was no big deal. And there you go. It's like, there's no way I should have been her legal guardian. But hmm. and I met one of my best, one of the long-term best friends because she was the, she was the person from the other winner so that's yeah. awesome yeah so i mean it's one of those things where it's like sometimes the universe will give you what you need and other times yeah. the universe no matter how much you want it's going to be like new no. yeah yeah and if it's meant to happen it doesn't have to make sense that's the thing people are like well why or how and it's like just let it happen because the best the best thing to do is just like just let it happen yeah. Let it be crazy. Let go. Go with the flow. Very much so. <laughs> so I mentioned that I closed my shop during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but you decided to, and it really wasn't a shop. I really should preface this. I had an office space and my husband had a room across the hall. So it wasn't yeah. really a shop, but you decided during the pandemic when everything was, everybody's like, I'm done. Bye. You decided yeah. to do the exact opposite. <laughs> I know that rebel, right? You know, yep. <laughs> it's always been me. Um, yeah, I was actually literally the way it happened. I was, we've had the business, God, since 2013 is when we really started it. And then it's just kind of grown and evolved. Well, it was taking up my whole townhouse. I mean, literally, it's just like, I didn't have a living room. I didn't have like everything was just, it was the shop and it wasn't like overtaking, like we made it work, but I was like, I want a home. I want a house. I was like, so I sat with my guides and I was like, look, I need something affordable. I need something that won't look at my credit right now. I'm in the building, you know, at the time I was working at the credit. I'm like, we're in the middle of pandemic. So I need it affordable <laughs> mm -hmm. and here we go let's go literally within a week the space that i had looked at five years before and was like this would be the perfect space boom it's now the shop <laughs> and it happened just like that we signed the papers on christmas eve if that nice. says anything nice and it's been affordable and i wasn't i was just really focusing online and then as soon as we got in there and we were trying to paint and get it ready, I was like, maybe we'll open it to the public. We'll see. I couldn't keep people away. I literally had to open the store early to let people in because literally every day we would have to turn away something, somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's just been crazy. And it's like, okay. Let's take this step. And it's been step after step after step. And it's just, it's wonderful to actually see we've had the store for over a year now. So, and it's been successful. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm honored. Now, the biggest thing now is, is to, you know, I told you I'm reshifting and everything. So it's kind of like, you know, we're kind of in, looking at what's working, what's not working, how can we make it better? We're kind of in that, that, that prepping area and, um, a percolation. I like that. I yeah. heard my guys go percolation area. <laughs> that was like, yes, that's exactly it. So I can start teaching because I miss teaching. You know, I do readings 
and my reading day is usually book up, (laughs) you know, it's hard. Um, So usually I'm useless on my reading days because I'm just like bump, bump. But now it's kind of like, let's, let's do it. And now it's just finding the right people, the right help. And that, that itself is, you know, another manifestation, another focus. So it's kind of like, it's all, it all comes together. And it's also been a trial of going, I never thought I was a businesswoman. Never. Like I, I was horrible at math. Like I was like, I can't do this. Hell I'm doing it. And I'm like, if I can do it, anybody else can do it. So I, I think, I think the thing is you're challenging yourself. I mean, not only are you challenging yourself in the material world, you're mm-hmm. doing something that I want to touch on is, is manifesting. And the fact is most of us say, okay, this is what I want, but I'm not specific. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm just going to say, this is what I want. I'm not being specific. I'm, and then if it's not happening in my, on my time schedule, then it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not how manifesting works. No, I see so many people going, well, and not only that, but that's not how psychic greetings work either. Like you'll get information and sometimes it's two years down the road or maybe it's happening the very next day. <laughs> it, it, the reason why I bring laugh is because yesterday and talk about divine intervention. So I'm in the middle of my house is a, a, a sty. I'm in the middle of decluttering everything because it's just it, I'm getting I'm going to end up selling it. But I threw a dog treat. And it bounced on the carpet and bounced into a, a shopping bag. Uh-huh. And the shopping bag was a bunch of audio cassettes. And I used to cause I used to record my readings on an audio cassette. So I pulled it out last night, and the reading was from August 21st of 2002. And of course, last night was the 21st of April. Mm-hmm. And so when I was listening to this reading, it freaked me out because something that was said is kind of something that's playing out or has the potential to play out coming up. And it's that's about 20 wonderful. years. And it's just kind of like, and she mentioned my husband who, you know, and it was like, okay. Yeah. So it was just one of those things where it's like, just because somebody told you something. And, and the thing is, life is so lilic. So if we didn't, do what we were supposed to do back then it's gonna Mm -hmm. come back around yes yes what is meant for you will always be yours and i think that that has been one of the most beautiful mantras that has helped me to just kind of go with things and not be so much in my head is like what is meant for me will be mine it doesn't matter if it has to come back five times around if it's meant for me it will happen when i'm ready for it yeah yeah. And that's the, that's the hard thing is you have to be, number one, you have to be ready for it. Otherwise, you can be in the perfect situation and have the things happen that you really think. Yes. But if you're not confident enough and ready for it, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. It, so Absolutely. I, I get that completely. So what kind of classes will you be offering? Or is this still just something that you're trying to gestate? And a little bit of both. Um, Psychic development, because that is so important for me. I would love to do a tarot class, but I might see if I have another local teacher to do it, um, depending on the time. Um, But I love teaching tarot. Tarot is so much fun to me. It's so... It's so in-depth. It can be as in-depth or not in-depth as as you want it. Um, I want to do some magic, some hoodoo. Um, I do have a class that I love talking about, which is what is voodoo and what is hoodoo? What's the difference? Because a lot of people are like, oh, the same. And I'm like, oh, no, (laughs) no, you're not. Um, So, you know, and I and I don't look for the voodoo. Like for me, it's like this is my personal belief, my personal practices, you know, I'm, I'm just like, that's mine. I don't really talk about it, but it finds me. And mm-hmm. it's like the spirits are like, nope, here you go. And I'm like, can I talk about it? You know, and it's kind of been, especially since um, the passing of my godfather at the time, you know, he just passed um, in February. So, you know, it's been kind of a, you know, 
my transition, it's kind of like, well, what do I do now? You know, do I go to another house? Do I find, you know, it, it's been a lot. So for me, I know I've been quiet, like on social media and everything for the past, I think mainly through the pandemic. And I've just, this past year has just been like hermit mode, but it's been like, I've been feeling the change to just kind of go within and really see a who I am and be where I'm wanting to take things and be smart about it, you know, because <clears throat> it's important. Yeah. I think that the pandemic forced a lot of us, if you really paid attention to do mm-hmm. that, we, we were forced. I mean, it was like, you don't have an option. This is what you have to do. And it, it's funny because I have been fighting selling this house. I've been fighting because it's like, this was our home. This is, this is where I feel good. But when I did a meditation the other night, it's like, this is, you can't stay here. And I mean, I knew this already. I was already to that point where I had come to, I got to let it go. But yeah. it was just in my, in the meditation, it was just screaming at me. It's like time to go. You have yeah. to move. And it's like, we don't, when we're, especially if you lost somebody during the pandemic, because the whole grieving process was not normal. No. No. So it's like you had you had to face yourself. You had to face your shadow side in some cases. Yeah. And say, okay, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to see and who am I now? Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest things is like if I'm not being true to who I am, am I if I'm not being true to who, you know, my ancestors sacrificed for me to be, you know, it's kind of like, what am I doing? What am I, you know, if I'm not going to listen, if I'm not going to work with them, not going to work with my guides, what, what am I doing? You know, I'm wasting um, precious time that we can't get back. And I think people forget that, that time is the one thing it we can't get back. No. We can't gain. We can't, you know, sometimes we can gain, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe. Maybe. I think that's debatable, but, you know, I think we're all here for a certain part in a certain time and, you know, and it's valuable and it, we need to listen to our purpose and our need to, to be in tune with who we are. And there's a lot in society today that distracts us from, from that message. Well, social media is, is a big one. And it's like, I, it's funny because I would have my friend who would read for me and she's like, I see you doing video. I see you doing ter- readings on camera. And I'm just like, no, no, I, I, it's like, it's not that I don't like reading. I do like reading. It's just, I didn't want to put myself out there because I did it for a while. I did it when I had the shop. I did the weekly tarot thing and it was just like, it went nowhere. And it's like, I don't want to do this again, but it's like the daily thing I do. And I do a weekly thing. Weekly is not as popular, but at this point I do it because it's a practice yeah. and it's back getting back to who I truly am. And that, that was the thing. It's like, I was fighting it so much because it's like, I can't be labeled an author or a podcaster and be a reader too, because there might be some negative connotation there. And it's like, you know what, who cares? Exactly. I think that's the whole point of, I think what the pandemic's taught me is just like, to get that rebel out and just say, I don't care because that used to be my attitude when you're younger, you know, you just don't care. And you put the middle finger out and it's like, okay, here we go. And it's like, we tame ourselves too much because we try to fit into the mold of what society thinks that we should be doing. And it's like, you can be rediscovering. I've had clients literally go, well, I don't, by the time I, I don't want to be old at 40. And I'm like, is 40 really old? <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> like, I'm like, honey, you've got, you can be starting over. And I'm, that's what I usually tell them. I go, you can be fucking 50 years old, 70 years old, and you're starting over. There's people, it's part of my language, I did cuss. Oh, no, so. that's fine. I was going <laughs> to say something. I was going to say something when you're talking about being younger. I mean, I used to walk around going, suck my dick. And I got one. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that in polite company nowadays, but back then. <laughs> and I think that's the thing is just being true to who we are and allowing us to be okay with being different. I've always used to, like I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, be different. Don't fit in. Be different. It's okay. I mean, while Madonna, we'll, we'll just use Madonna while she's still trying to 
hang on to her you yeah um yeah she's being her and the fact that she has continually transformed herself and i know from my own experience i can sit here and look at my life and go okay from the age of 22 to 26 i was a uh, mom mm-hmm. and then i was single and then from like 30 something to 52 i was married again mm-hmm. and you know and now i'm single again so it's just yeah. one of those things where it's like you have to you have to understand that life is going to change and sometimes there's going to be a curveball thrown at you and yeah. then you're going to have to figure it out. And it's got to be again that famous phrase go with the flow because if you fight it it just gets worse. Right. And I mean I I have to say because I have been fighting holding on to this house it's like I want to sell things and nothing was selling and as soon as I've kind of relinquished that yeah I have to do this things have started to flow where I'm starting to sell some Mm -hmm. stuff. So it's just like, you have to, if you're going to fight, the universe is going to say, okay, we can sit here all day. (laughs) Yes. yes. But if you're willing to do the work and step into it, it will help. You lean in, you lean in. If it scares you, do it. Lean in. I I posted a meme like that today. It was talking about if you, if you, if something scares you, then do it because obviously it's the right thing to be doing. So where do you, do you think you're going to stay in the same location or do you see you moving into a bigger space? I mean, we're going to have to move to a bigger space. Like we've already outgrown it. Like before year one came up, it was like, we're outgrowing. We we can't stay between production and with everything. It's like, we're going to have to grow. And I'm locked in until the end of the year, but I'm like, who knows what tomorrow brings? I mean, the property managers shifted. They've gotten, I'm like, they could come in tomorrow and say, adios, you know, I was like, so just embrace what's going on. You know, yeah. my main focus has been, uh, it's starting to shift a little bit more online, which is interesting, which is telling me like, okay, there's some sort of movement getting ready to happen because, you know, this is all, it's shifting from the community to now back up to the online. Maybe you need to find some kind of balance there. Maybe that's what it's about. It could be. It could be. There's nothing like us in this area. And a lot of people don't understand Southern Conjure and they don't understand New Orleans. Like literally, <laughs> you know, and growing up in New Orleans, you know, sometimes you don't even understand New no Orleans. Luck. But- when I, as soon as I say, <laughs> firstly, as soon as I say I'm from New Orleans and then if they find out I was born on Friday the 13th, oh, I am the witchiest person they know. And I should be able to tell them all about voodoo. It's like, no. We don't, we do not, it's not the movies you saw in the 80s where we have the voodoo priestess running around or (laughs) on the originals. It's not like that at all. Nope. But if you want to think that I'm I'm special because of those things, (laughs) oh, and it was October, Friday the 13th. Let me even preface it there. But that is awesome. (laughs) Well, and then the even cooler thing, and I really am just numerology crazy. If you take my birth time, it's another 13. Lucky number 13. Exactly. So it's like, I'm okay. So, yeah. But but people think, yeah, oh, you're from New Orleans, so you must be. Well, it's not only that, but up here, like, they associate New Orleans uh, with boobs, beads, and alcohol. And I mean, <laughs> like, like Mardi Gras, I'm just like, there's so much more to New Orleans. And even in Mardi Gras season, I'm like, do you not understand? Mardi Gras is very family, family friendly. And it's kind of like. <sighs> I took my husband down Bourbon Street because the only time we ever went on vacation was to go see my family. So we're staying in the quarter because my dad's house is there now. So we're staying in the quarter and I'm like, let's go down Bourbon Street. Now, mind you, he's an older, he's in his forties at this point. He's like, Mm -hmm. all right. So we get there. We went to Marie Laveau's, which (laughs) my husband's legally blind. I'm getting a reading and he is at the altar looking at all the rings that have been left, not realizing that he should not be touching these things. He can't see. He's legally blind. And so the lady's like, sir, sir, you're not supposed to, because he's like taking them off and trying them on. Oh, no. Anyway, so that's a whole nother side story. But um, so we're walking down Bourbon Street. My husband's like, what's that smell? I'm like, <laughs> come on. 
Son, you know what that smell is. Of course, it really turns out later on that they had all the lard underneath the streets. But I'm like, John, uh, you know that smell? It goes, it's, it's beer, stale beer. I'm like, mm-hmm. I think he said sweat and piss. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. He's like, is there anything else we need to see down here? I'm like, not really. There's just strip clubs and bars. Nah, we don't need to go. It was during the day anyway. It's like, okay. Now, as a younger man, he would have been all for it. But yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but you're but right. That's, like, what, that's what people think of New Orleans, Bourbon Street. They do. And it's like, there's so much more. And if they really got into the history and it's such a special city, it really is. I think, you know, between, I've been to both Salem and, and New Orleans and, you know, I'm from the South. So a lot of my family, you know, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's, it's special and it's unique, but it's so, you know, I love it. It's got a place in my heart. One of my, one of my things I most remember about all the things when I was growing up on, on the field trips we went to, mm-hmm. we went to the Cabildo and the Besides the Mardi Gras stuff, there was one thing that stood out to me. And it's really weird that this would stand out, but I still remember it to this day. And it was seeing Napoleon's death mask. Oh, yeah. I don't remember anything else about the other museums. I just remember seeing Napoleon's death mask. And I think oh. that just took me back because it was just like, as a kid, why would somebody do this? I guess. I don't know. But it still stood out. It still stands out to my to me today. It's mm-hmm. like... I don't know why, but that was something that just stuck with me. And that's the thing. You got your Spanish history there. You have your French history there. People don't look at the bigger picture. They don't. They don't. And I mean, it's got more than that. They've got Sicilian Mm -hmm. history there. They've got Irish. They've got the, Mm -hmm. of course, the African, Mm -hmm. you know, and even Haitian because they would bring, you know, that in between. And I mean, there's just so much. Mm-hmm. There's just so much. And then, of course, the indigenous that was in that area. And see, here's, a, and yeah, I mean, we had the we had the Choctaw River Parade. Mm-hmm. We had the Choctaw Parade. And the thing is, when you're learning history about Louisiana, the main cultures they focus on are the, Louis, are the French and the Spanish. And that's it. And nobody really realizes how big Louisiana really was. Yeah. Yeah. But they sold it all away. They did. Because actually, did. technically, I guess I'd still be sitting in Louisiana right now. <laughs> <laughs> in Illinois. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, so um, if you, where can people find your shop and your products? I mean, should they just start online to get a feel? If they're, especially if they're go not online. in Indiana. Yeah. Go online to, um, threecrowsconjure.com or if you're in in the local indie area we're on madison avenue we're 7220 madison avenue in indianapolis um we're on instagram we're on facebook i don't think we're on twitter i i just it was like no <laughs> well now that elon musk may be buying twitter <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> okay so I'm like, we're on TikTok. I do have a TikTok. We haven't made movies yet. I'm still getting to know TikTok. I'm like. <laughs> I, I I have a hard time with TikTok, but um, I actually, it's the one account I have to say that I have more followers now than the people I follow. Really? Yeah. I have not been able to do that until now. And that happened okay. this week. So. <sighs> Well, we may have to talk. You may have to help me on this because I'm like, uh, yeah, me, TikTok. I don't know. We can talk. But, about okay. But yeah, uh, those are the main areas that you can find us. So Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, and then our website, www.threecrowsconjure.com. And our, come to the store at 7220 Madison Avenue in Indianapolis. So. And I do know that it was definitely better to take that risk and open up the brick and mortar since you're expanding so much. So, yeah. I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful. And and honestly, it's just been, it's been cool to see the community and Indianapolis is so huge and the community is so big and scattered and, and it's nice because everybody's like, I really like the shop. It's different. And I'm like, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like being that different and 
it gives people like, because we can make our candles, we can pour every candle we make. We make our oils, our powders, our incense, even our incense sticks, we hand dip. So we make our soaps. And then we try to find custom artists. Since we've kind of expanded the shop, I'll have to, you'll see it on our Facebook and stuff, but we opened it up where we, it's now one big room, Mm -hmm. like our main um, storefront. And people walk in and like, wait, you've changed it. Oh my God, I like it so much bigger. And it's like, so people are seeing and they're embracing and it's been nice. So, yeah. Good. Well, I wish you much success and moving forward. You too. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So the conversation, you know, I didn't even think about that, but how many times did I invoke the goddess Isis? Hmm. It it just makes you wonder because that was the whole catchphrase on the show when she turned into Isis. But I have to applaud Amanda for the fact, and TJ, for the fact that they took that risk and it's turned into a boom for them. I mean, they have to expand again because they have done so well. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. It's like, while well, most of us walked away because there, it wasn't viable. Some people found a new life under the pandemic and in the pandemic. And I'm glad that she is now thriving. And I look forward to seeing where the business is going to go. Because I have a feeling it's going to continue to just morph into something else. So on that note, definitely check them out online. And if you're in the Indianapolis area, go to the store. Because I'm sure you can find something interesting and entertaining. And on that note, well, if you have a question, comment, or concern, you can email me at Donna, D-A-U-N-A, at better2podcast.com. That's Donna at better2podcast.com. And if you missed an episode and want to catch up, besides finding it on your local provider, you can also find it at better2podcast.com. All our social media links are there as well. And as always, the show is brought to you by DM Needham and Kitty Mystic, as well as our audio is done by Rich Zai of Third Ear Audio. Anyway, I hope you have a fantastic day, weekend, evening, whenever you choose to listen to the podcast. And I'll catch you next time, guys. Bye. The Better Two Podcast is mixed, edited, and produced by Rich Zai of Third Ear Audio Productions.